You're listening to Catalyst Talks, conversations with change agents, outliers, superheroes, and truly conscious leaders modeling what it is to be an unstoppable force for good and truth in this world. What lit these catalysts on fire to do their work and what nuggets of wisdom can they share with a world literally on fire? I'm your host, Stephanie Trigger. I'm a transformational catalyst and life coach to maverick change agents in business leadership and life. On this podcast, I wear an eclectic mix of hats, including earthkeeper, wayfinder, truth teller, coach, lawyer, business and impact strategist. My intention is holding space for higher purpose, peak wellness, soul mastery, and deeper impact so we can live in harmony with ourselves, each other, and nature. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. If you love it, please share and spread the word. We're on YouTube and all the podcast platforms. See the show notes on CatalystTalks.com for links and enjoy this episode. Welcome back to Catalyst Talks Podcast. My guest today is Charles Eisenstein, a teacher, speaker, and writer focusing on themes of civilization, consciousness, money, and human cultural evolution. He's the author of Sacred Economics, a book that commingles actual economics with the psycho-spiritual dimensions of money. He's also written Climate, A New Story, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible, The Ascent of Humanity, and The Yoga of Eating. Charles is a storyteller whose narratives build trust and possibility and help one arrive at their own truth. In this episode, we unpack some ideas around programming, morality, social credits, tracking, roles, self-rejection, fear and control, censorship, scapegoating, and the mythology of reality unfolding right now. And while both of us share an opinion on the current events of the moment, there are many principles shared here that will help you arrive at your own. Stay tuned and enjoy this episode. Hello, Charles, and thank you for being with me today. It's such a gift. I want to open this space with an acknowledgement that nothing we say today will be sanitized or curated or necessarily comfortable, yet for those who truly hear, may it provide some comfort. You're a philosopher, a storyteller, a mythologist, and you have a really gifted way of shedding light, perception, and perspective on critical issues using a super potent narrative and philosophical prose. And your words land in a way that really allow me and a reader to come to their own place of meaning making. And I've always really admired you for that. Um, You've recently been sharing your opinion on the divisive truth of this moment, the Corona moment, and sharing your opinions may be challenging people's opinion or perception of you. Um, Those who maybe have eaten up your words in the past, and now maybe there's a category uh, that exists, you know, that didn't before. And you know, we're seeing those categories in the world more than ever. Um, I'm feeling it myself as well. And they, they sort of seem to exist around a strategy that's unfolding right now. And it's not a new strategy. And in your essays, you write about the mythology and history of these strategies, including your recent work on around JFK and the assassination and Nazi Germany, the Rwandan genocide, scapegoating in general, the strategies we're seeing aren't new. Um, And I, like you, am on the continuum moving towards the more beautiful world my heart knows is possible, recognizing the encumbrances of my own wounds and programming, as well as society's wounds and programming. So today, I'm really excited and keen to unpack some ideas around this with you, around programming, morality, social credits, tracking, roles, things you speak about like self-rejection, fear and control, censorship, scapegoating, and just the mythology of reality unfolding right now. So just to kick us off, I'm curious where your mind is at in this now moment. What's up for you, Charles? Well, in the last few days, most of what I've been speaking on in interviews and stuff was around COP26. Uh, I've been quite active as an environmentalist or as an environmental philosopher uh, for some time. And one of the... uh, um, points that I've been making is about reductionism, which is one of these, <clears throat> you call them strategies, maybe patterns would be a better word for it, but, but also strategies uh, of solving a problem by finding the one cause of that problem, preferably a cause that you can attack in some way, that you can quantify in some way, and then apply the apparatus of um, cost, benefit, min, max, to get those numbers down, and the problem is solved. 
So in, in the environmental sphere, that is the equation of green with low carbon and the panacea, it'll solve all the world's ecological problems if only we can bring those carbon numbers down, or at least that's the main thing. So I have a whole critique of that mindset um, that comes not from, oh, the environment's fine, global warming, ah, 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 you know, drill, baby, drill, but rather from a deep environmentalist conviction. Well, that same pattern, I mean, and you mentioned some of the things, even like the self-rejection, the war on the self, like what's the bad thing in me? But that same pattern has um, <clears throat> shown itself in the last two years uh, with the pandemic, where here we have decades of declining health, actually, compared to general levels of health when I was a kid, people are way more subject to chronic disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, addiction, depression, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> than they were a generation ago. But there was not a comfortable way to, like there was no enemy that we could easily identify. So what did we do about this? Nothing, basically. We certainly didn't turn society upside down in order to deal with the precipitous decline in, in well-being until COVID came along. <clears throat> and now we had something that fit the pattern that enabled us to deploy these tools that ultimately are about control. And it was almost like the collective and especially the elites breathed a sigh of relief Finally, here's a problem we know what to do something about. And it was many forms of control, lockdowns, masks, isolation, distancing, vaccines, all the way to impose control onto the world and thereby solve the problem. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm coming off a cold here, <coughs> which is good. Um, a detox. Yeah, a detox. But anyway, I don't know. Maybe that's a starting point. I could go into different aspects of that. Mm -hmm. um, love to talk about, you know, science um, and what that is. I'd love to talk about progressive values. I'd love to just polarization, really any topic that you want to bring into it. Um, yes. Yeah. I'm, thank you for, thank you for laying that out. And it's, it is to me interesting that the the comparison you made around environmental being an environmentalist. And I too have a, a background as an environmentalist in the nineties, you know, pretty, pretty radical <laughs> and, and saw the device experience, the division really, really firsthand on the front lines. And what has come up for me, and I guess I'd love to dive into this with you is kind of reconciling, um, those who are so connected, not those, this is a huge generalization. Yeah. But that there, there are folks who are so connected to, to earth and nature. And I'm just going to use an example here for like indigenous people, say just some indigenous groups or communities or shamans, earth keepers around the world who, uh, who I, I kind of know some of the liaisons that are, work with shamans and kind of built those bridges with the Western world. And I'm just hearing that a lot of those communities are like so excited for the vaccine and that they really want to, uh, you know, see this as like the good spirit to combat the bad spirit and have this perception um, around it. And to me, I, and then this is just coming from my own experience and, and I don't know, maybe it's not even me, it's coming from somewhere else, but a piece of information or a sense that this is really connected to some uh, uh, more of like a, the collective trauma around from native people and indigenous people from colonizers who, you know, came with the diseases and wiped them out that, you know, those were their pandemics. They've experienced many more pandemics than we have. Our common flu was a, or cold was a pandemic for them, for, you know, them just being, I'm talking about some indigenous groups. And so, you know, that to me, I'm looking at that psychology. I'm curious, I'm reconciling that, huh? If like you really understand what's going on with nature and the earth and, and just this, the kind of longer long-term history of, of colonizing and destruction to me, it's, these are the, it's the same paradigm right. unfolding right now. So it's like, like gratefully receiving the white man's 
cure to the white man's sickness. Um, and it's understandable when, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to start here before I even make any comment on that. I was going to say it's understandable that, and actually everything is understandable. If you, if you are willing to look at why do people believe what they believe? Why do they do what they do? And uh, resist the easy, familiar, and wrong diagnosis of they're just bad. They're just ignorant. They're just sheep. They're just stupid. Like, oh my God, so much contempt on both sides, on every side of every issue, all diagnosing their, their opponents as some lower form of human, human life. This almost universal diagnosis, because I am, you know, familiar with left and right. I visit websites, comments, sections on every side, always the same thing, this common agreement on what is the problem here. And I think that that is actually the problem. It's called dehumanization. It's what white supremacy is all about, actually. It's the tool with which Native people have been exploited. You know, you make them less than human, and then anything is justified. So let's be careful not to do that. So anyway, um, if you, th so the way that the pandemic has been narrated and the paradigm surrounding it, if you take all of that for granted, then yeah, the vaccine is a savior, or at least potentially, provided it actually works, which is becoming more and more debatable. Uh, but but let's like, let's say that you accept that, then yeah, and if you accept that the vaccine is the medicine, the cure, then it becomes a matter of the equitable distribution of this medicine, and you know, it looks like the wealthy countries, the affluent, are getting it first, just as has always happened in relations with the third world, in relations with, with the um, downtrodden people of this earth. So our instinct for justice says, let's bring the vaccines to everybody. Maybe let's bring it to them first and, and you know, make it fair, make it equitable. So it's coming from a very good place if you take, and, and it's understandable if you take certain assumptions for granted. Unfortunately. Okay, and this could be a whole rabbit hole that we probably don't want to get into, the validity of these assumptions. But what I, what I would like to say is that um, the whole um, medical paradigm that motivates this narrative is itself a product of the West, of modernity, um, of what's sometimes called white, although it's certainly not the um, monopoly of any race at this point, but it's like the way that disease is even conceived and it, it's, it's like the cause of it being a pathogen, for example, and the cure being something to disable or kill the pathogen. This was by no means, is still by no means a universal understanding of what disease is. Other people had, they might say that it's a spirit, uh, an evil spirit that has gotten into you. Or they might say that it's an um, imbalance of uh, archetypal energies in your body. Heat, cold, dryness, dampness, wind in Chinese medicine. Like there, there are other ways to understand the body and by extension, other ways to understand reality, under, other ways to understand causality than the hegemonic imperial standard. So, you know, I would say that, and, and, you know, when a culture has had all of these traditional ways of seeing ripped away from them, and the social patterns that went along with these ways of seeing destroyed 
by market economics. Uh, boy, am I really getting in trouble here with a, uh, I mean, I'm uh, insulting many sacred cows here, but when, when their life ways have been destroyed, their mythologies have been destroyed, et cetera, et cetera, they are left helpless and in need of charity, in need of the only cure that is left, which is that of the colonizer. And if you withhold that too, that's even worse. So I can see where, where this is coming from. But what I would love to see is a um, reestablishment and honoring a resurgence of traditional ways of healing, traditional ways of seeing, seeing traditional conceptions of, of illness and health, then there would be a lot more on the menu than just vaccine or no vaccine. So can you speak to, uh, you know, when I think of the, you know, the indigenous, the example of indigenous communities or native people, it's really a microcosm for all, all of humanity whose minds are colonized by everything that you just, you know, everything you just laid out. So can you speak to that, the, the, the macrocosm of, of just what colonization though I guess the role that colonization has to play in everything we're seeing unfolding right now. And this, and kind of, I, I link this to, you, you know, you talked about, um, you know, in sacred economics, you speak about like, you know, take it away so that you can give it back with a cost, you know, that you can give the, take it away. So there's a need and right. they need it from you and there's a cost. Yeah. Yeah. That's related. Um, if you, I, I think I gave the example, you know, if you have a culture that um, sings its own songs, builds its own houses, uh, grows its own food, tells its own stories, then that is an undeveloped market, a place where potentially you could sell them songs, downloads, sell them entertainment, sell them stories, sell them houses, sell them food, sell them culture, and um, in return, get their natural resources and their labor. So they will have entered a money economy by our GDP metrics, they will be better off and certainly will be better off too, because here's a, um, a, a place to uh, postpone the crisis of capitalism that, that requires that we always need new markets. So in order to make, to, in order to open that market, somehow or other, they have to stop providing all these things for themselves. And that could be done in many ways. It could be done through religion that invalidates their stories and worldviews. It could be done by force, by, you know, um, evicting them from their traditional lands and making them work on the sugar plantation. Um, it could be done through taxation. You have to pay taxes in currency. Um, they're, they're, it could be done with, with through paramilitaries and death squads that intimidate them. I mean, there's so many ways. It can be done through propaganda. It can be done through glamorous images of, of modern society where nobody has to work and everybody's happy all the time that, that you might see in Hollywood movies, you know? although less recently, but, but there's like a whole, um, the education system uh, upholding uh, a vision of progress and telling them that they're backward. So there's many ways that we can take away what they have had, um, calling their healing modalities superstitious, for example, and then sell it back. So this the same thing, and you know, and there's even a deeper level of it though, because I'm not going to dispute that there are benefits to the, the kind of technology that we, you and I are familiar with. Like modern medicine can perform miracles. 
you're burned over 90% of your body, you know, if you're hemorrhaging blood, if you have acute sepsis. I mean, there are incredible things that modern medicine can do. I don't want to discount those. But, and maybe the death rate is lower. Maybe um, longevity um, is higher. Like we live longer than we did uh, 200 years ago. So I'm not discounting that that truth, but even the idea of um, security and death postponement and the um, mania for avoiding suffering, like the idea that suffering is something that can be avoided, that death is something that can be avoided, um, that in itself is of, of a defining mindset of modernity. It's part of the idea of the conquest of nature. And what, what greater conquest could there be than to conquer suffering and death? So we have a medical system that's kind of geared around that. But that is a, another form of colonialism to impose that on other people. Now, yeah, no one wants to die. I'm not saying that, that we should ignore it, but there are more important things in life than staying as safe as possible. Because we can't survive life. And that the mentality of modernity, well, I could go a lot into where that comes from, but I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll rein it in here and, uh, no, I, I appreciate I appreciate all the threads you tie together, and something that really stuck for me, that sparked for me, is like as you're talking about the village that you know makes their builds their own houses, has their own songs, has their own healing modalities, and it really it's like as you're saying that I see that 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 is just a microcosm, and and the collective that is what is unfold how how um, people can look at that and see it and make exact like the the reasoning you're laying out hear it see it and get it and yet not be getting w how it's playing out in the larger collective right now us Western yeah. world yeah and it would be um, itself an an imperial attitude to think that like so I said okay yeah maybe uh, maybe you know they don't live as long and they suffer more, not necessarily. Uh, it's like indigenous and traditional and new holistic modes of healing that are not about control, not about the technological imposition of control, actually also have the capacity to work miracles. I see it almost every day um, through my wife, who's a healer. And people walk in here with, with like serious medical conditions mm -hmm. that are decades long. They've been told again and again and again that it's incurable. We can palliate symptoms maybe with these medicines, but these have other side effects. And like sometimes in one session, they'll be healed or a few sessions. So the limits of our um our conventional way of of operating in the world are becoming more and more obvious this is i think the this is a source of actually great hope for me right now the loss of faith in the world story that has held modern society for a long time it's a story of progress it's a story of conquest that and it says that we will be happier and happier healthier and healthier wealthier and wealthier thanks to science and technology that is carrying us toward utopia when i was young this was very strong almost undeniable whether you were a, a liberal or a conservative a capitalist or a socialist the betterment of the human estate was taken for granted through the means and methods of reason, science, technology. 
the future was going to be awesome. And now it's 50 years later. And that paradise, not only has it not manifested, but it seems like we're going toward the opposite of paradise. So there's a tremendous loss of faith that corresponds to a crisis in meaning and identity. And that gives me a lot of hope because that breakdown is what opens our minds to something from entirely outside the story, outside the mythology, outside the way that we narrate to ourselves what is real and what is possible and how to be a human being. And part of that awakening is a renewed interest in the worldviews and technologies of indigenous people. So that, yeah, and that, that is what can get us unstuck because right now our means and methods are only intensifying the dilemma that we're in. It's like, you know, it's, it's the pattern of meeting a failure of control with even more of it. If Roundup stops working, then we find a new pesticide. If um, the uh, razor wire fences and, and cameras aren't stopping school shootings, well, you know, let's add some more measures. If uh, masks aren't stopping the spread of COVID, well, double mask, triple mask. If the vaccine didn't work, well, a booster, you know, some other medicine. Like it's always, um, this, it's the same pattern. And I think we are just almost at a tipping point. I mean, to take it back to COVID where the um, harms and ineffectiveness of the vaccines are becoming more and more obvious to more and more people. And, you know, you could, I mean, this gets into a whole thicket of conspiracy theories and so forth, but you don't have to believe that um, evil is in charge to identify this broad pattern of, of the addiction to control. And we're seeing it not, you know, in, in public health policy too, and, and the abrogation of civil liberties and, um, you know, the, the locked down society. The idea here, and this is a part of a much bigger picture that did not start with COVID. The idea is that if we could only track and label and quantify everything in the world, this is what the internet of things is, and, and keep track of all of it and manage it, then we could administer it rationally. If we get it into the data set, we could administer it rationally and maximize whatever metrics we choose. And the metrics should be of human happiness. So it turns into this gigantic min-max problem that who knows, maybe artificial intelligence could administer. And then we'd finally be happy. And if it isn't working, that means that there's still more that we have to get into the data set. So this is a actually hundreds of years old idea that 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 we've got to get in control of everything through technology to make the world better. It goes back to Descartes, you know, it goes back hundreds of years. And that is what is coming into question now, as we are seeing <clears throat> technologies of control taken to their logical extreme. And the question is how far are we willing to pursue them before we choose another path? Mm. Something, something that I really have a hard time reconciling, well, I don't have a hard time reconciling it. It's it is what it is, but it's, it's yeah, hard to, hard to reconcile the fact that others aren't connecting the dots here. So, um, and I just, I, I don't say that with any judgment. It's just, it's really like a, a thing I'm trying to sort out. And, it, and that is the idea of, 
of, I'm sure you, you mentioned COP26, like the, the, the way we're going to solve all the problems of the environment is through technology and um, smart cities and smart grids and ID cards and tracking and, and that there really is this kind of, and then we connect it to connecting it to the things that people care about, right? Like social justice and social credits and connecting it to car- decarbonization and, and, and the good stuff. And so then you get the good people who want to participate in that and like kind of get the buy-in. So there's this, um, what is going to be the, the how, how are people going to wake up to what you just, how you just connected all those dots, right? It's like, you can see it and yet there's still just dots that aren't connecting. And those are like the critical, the critical yeah. dots. <clears throat> it is a painful process to let go of reality as you had known it. Because it also involves yourself as you had known yourself. A collapse in worldview is traumatic. And people hold on quite tightly to the sense and meaning and identity that that they have grown into. It's also very hard to go against the crowd. Normally, when a human being sees something anomalous, sees something that that unexpected, the first thing you do is you turn to the person next to you and you say, did you see that? In a mass society, you turn to the, um, the collective knowledge that is found in science and academia and the media, you know, that say, here's what's real. So did I just see that? Oh, oh, here's what's real. Oh, okay. No. I can explain that away as something else. That wasn't a, a lion. That was a shadow. You know, that wasn't, right? It was, it was something normal. This tendency that we have, it's a perfectly fine, healthy tendency to look to those around us to confirm our reality can be hijacked by financial, corporate, government, totalitarian forces. And it becomes a liability. And in those times, when authority, who we are programmed to respect, because in a healthy society, people have authority because they have earned respect. So we naturally respect authority. But in a time when authority is untrustworthy, then we need to rely on the outliers who, in a normal society, in a healthy society, are actually a problem. You know, those who are like even to the point of being psychopathic, but those who ignore group norms and think in their own, you know, their own way. Um, A healthy society has to have some of those to keep it on track to prevent mass delusion and groupthink. Anyway, this is one of those times. So, but what does it take for people to let go, to start connecting those dots? Often it takes something... Um, oh, thank you so much. This is just what I needed. Yeah, what does it take for them to let go? Unfortunately, it takes often a direct experience that so flagrantly violates the narrative <clears throat> that you just have to let go. I uh, came across yesterday a very sad example of this. It was a series of uh, <clears throat> screenshots of, of a Twitter feed. And the, the first one, the woman's like, you know, going to get my kids vaccinated. You know, she had a teenage son or something. And it's going to be great. You know, we're going we're gonna to lick this thing. And then it's like, yeah, my, you know, my son is having some uh, pretty intense reactions. I asked him if he's still glad he got vaccinated. He said, yes, you know, it's, you know. It's rare and it's temporary. Third one, she's like, you know, we're at the hospital. He's been diagnosed with myocarditis, you know, mild, though they say it's mild myocarditis. And then the fourth one is just like, mild means you have to be in the hospital for four days and then indefinitely into the future, keep going back for appointments. You know, this is costing me a lot of money. Like you see over time, her transformation into like pretty much like, a rabid anti-vaxxer. 
that would not have happened without this experience. Oh, and then like her Twitter account got blocked because she's like, I can post like, yeah, like, like, you know, as misinformation, but she's like, this actually happened to me. You know, why are they saying it's misinformation? So if that's a few isolated things, you know, then okay, no big deal. But, you know, now we're seeing whistleblowers come out, doctors, you know, saying they're seeing huge numbers of these things, like it's starting to leak through the boundaries of reality, of normality, that keeps everything normal, that assures us that we're, we've been right all along, um, that everything's okay. Starting to, to leak out of that. And I mean, I wish it could happen without, you know, this kind of tragedy which is unfolding on a huge scale now. Um, and you know who I really admire? It's not the people who are right all along. It's the people who can admit to themselves that they were wrong. Because to do that, you have to render a sacrifice of your self-image, of being right and good and better than. And in a society where our um, self-esteem is conditional, where we've been trained to esteem ourselves for being good and being right, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to let go of that self-image. But if people don't do that, our society is never going to come together. Like, and I, you know, I, in the last year and a half, I've been through this so deeply, like, okay, what if I'm wrong about everything? What if COVID is exactly what the authorities and pharmaceutical companies are telling us it is? Um, what if the vaccines are the only thing that's going to save us? Like, I, I've like, not even as an intellectual exercise, but like full on in that reality. Because I want to be willing to be wrong. And whatever sacrifice it takes, I want to be willing to go there. Why? Because that's the only hope for this planet. The biggest problem facing humanity today, it's not COVID. It's not, you know, vaccines, should they prove to be as dangerous as some people think. It's not climate change. It's not nuclear Armageddon. Biggest crisis is a crisis of communication. Because if we are coherent, there's no problem that is hard to solve. Not even climate change. Technically easy. Not even world hunger, which is killing like something like 20 or 30,000 people a day, many times more than COVID. Like, where's the uproar about that? That's an intractable problem that's been with us for decades, easy to solve, actually. There's plenty of food. It's just a matter of distribution. Distribution is a matter of agreements among human beings. That's what economics is, actually. That's what money is. It's agreements among human beings. So the deepest crisis is a crisis of the word. It's a crisis of, of story, of how we hold each other and hold ourselves. So whoever is right, whichever side is right, and it may not be my side, somebody's got to be wrong. And for us to heal, somebody is going to have to do it. Somebody's going to have to let go of that self-image. Somebody's going to have to admit that they were wrong. Somebody's going to have to change their minds. And it's brave to do that. And how can we help that process? It is by first recognizing that it is brave and second, counteracting this, this field of derision and contempt that makes it even more important to be right. Like, what if we're more gentle with each other? What if we're like, yeah, maybe you were wrong about that all the time. I've been wrong about things too. And I was just operating from the information set that I had, and you were too, it's not that you're stupid. And there's forgiveness here. 
And maybe you were caught up in a hysteria. Maybe you even did horrible things unwittingly as part of that hysteria. But if we, um, and I see a lot of this on, on the you know health freedom sites, like how these people are gonna be punished for crimes against humanity in New Nuremberg. I'm like, <clears throat> that's not where healing comes from. That's gonna actually make it harder. If, if, what, if, if admitting you're wrong means going up before the tribunal, it's gonna be even harder to admit you, you were wrong. You know, let's, let's have some compassion here. And isn't there a part of all of us that recognizes that that is the revolution? It's not one side finally overcomes the other with force of evidence and logic. That could happen, but that is just another cycle of the endless war. A real revolution would be that we stop dehumanizing each other. And we ask, what is it like to be you? And not default to, if you've done bad things, it must be because you're a bad person. And the solution is to take you down, to humiliate you, to punish you, to lock you up. That's the same mentality as industrial agriculture. It's the same mentality as the war on terror. It's the same mentality as the prison industrial complex. And it's the same mentality as modern medicine in the pandemic. You see, I'm actually a leftist. It's really weird how all of a sudden uh, COVID unorthodoxy has become like this thing that is supposed to associate with you with the right wing. I'm like, no, I'm a leftist. Since when is, is it right wing to be skeptical of the pharmaceutical industrial complex. You know, I don't, I don't get it here. So yeah, anyway, um, I'm, I'm seeing a common pattern, so yeah. Yeah, I, I have actually had the same aha, like, and been put in a, I've been put in a kind of a box of, I don't want to use right and left. In fact, some I, I see, saw a really wonderful quote. I don't know where it came from, but I'll just say it. The the left and the right wing are are wings of the same bird. But um, the you know the it is fascinating to be able to step back and 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 just look at what's going on. You your your phrase uh, the collapse in worldview is traumatic, and I think the first step to that is being able to look at somebody and understand and say, like, if I had your worldview, I would do the same thing. Like that is the first step because I think there's so few people who are willing. Well, I won't say that there's plenty who do that, but there, there are people, if you, if you're not unable to do that, if you're unable to, that's the compassion, I think the first bridge of compassion. And another thing I wanted to, to kind of put on the table and hear your thoughts on is in, in that process, in order to get to that, the place where you can actually do that, um, it, it takes being willing to like, look at your own worldview of yourself, right? Not about the other and out there, but being willing. So this kind of holographic nature of what is going on inside of us, like you talk about self-rejection, right? I call it the inner work of impact. You know, we're all into impact and positive impact in the world, the inner work of impact first, right? Because then once you can connect those dots, <gasps> Oh, that was part of my family lineage. Oh, that's a pattern from this program or that program. Oh my God, I had this belief about myself all along, my own self-image. And if I can only let that worldview tramp, you know, like dissolve or do what needs to be done to heal or transform or outgrow or mature through that, then it is much easier. You, you already have a much bigger, uh, wider lens to do that externally. So how do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that that's definitely one of the um, roads to a positive kind of doubt. Uh, when, when I'm so sure about something in the world, um, what is the psychological benefit? of that certainty do i believe it because like so for example in my in my case 
I tend to be very skeptical of authority, defiant even. So I ask, how much of that is because of a dispassionate review of all of the evidence on every side that then I've come to a rational conclusion about? And how much of that is the playing out of defiance against my father? You know, like uh, that tints my lens to make authority look bad. Now that doesn't mean that my skepticism of authority is only because of my relationship to my father. But I'd better ask that question so that I, I can distinguish um, what is coming from uh, reason and what is coming from emotion. And I'm not sure if I can ever fully parse that, but it helps me actually to trust myself when, I'm, when I become aware of these psychodynamics. And on the other side, you know, there's a certain um, gratification and comfort in acquiescing to authority. There's a certain safety there. Like you might feel loved in that way if you um, display the views of the authority figure. And there's also, um, a safety in that, when it's not only authority, but it's also the views of the majority, because historically it's been very dangerous um, to deviate from group norms, because then you can become a scapegoat. And we're seeing this happen actually, when when the unvaxed are being blamed for, you know, it's a pandemic of the unvaxed for spreading the virus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Recent research is actually demolishing that idea, but you know it, it doesn't need research. This is not rational. It's a psychological pattern of 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 scapegoating, of associating deviance with being dirty, with being unclean, with being untouchable. So a lot here to to sort through. <clears throat> And, you know, it's okay to be guided by emotion, to, to, to have that operating in us. But let's not pretend that we're actually being rational. Yeah, well, that speaks to, I mean, how many times I've been asked, show me the science, show me the science, like just send me the article, send me the report, send me the whatever. Oh, yeah, I've had that too. And then I send it, you know, like, you expect me to read that crap? Like it's not, you know, you can send 50 articles and then they'll find one that contradicts that article. And pretty soon you're in the war of the dueling studies. <laughs> you, know, you don't get anywhere. It's, and so it is this. How, so, OK, then how do you respond to? Well, then show me the show me the article or something, the research on the psychological pattern you're talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a big one. That's. Myth, there's mythology in it. There's, I right. mean, it, it's forever. I, mean, I wrote a five part essay series on this, you know, totaling some 20 or 30,000 words with lots of citations, but that's not going <clears> to <throat> convince anybody who's um, not open to considering it. And yeah. I mean, yeah. That brings me. So I think what I would love to dive into with you then from here is the, the notion of, uh, agreements, because what we're saying, right, you're talking about belonging. And so part, partially we're talking about, um, th there's an agreement we're colluding with, a story we're coll colluding with. And, and there, there are, there's this mass censorship happening as well. It's like, well, where's the information? Why aren't I seeing that? Well, because censorship. And so what, what the agreements are built on are what? I mean, they're pe people's need for belonging, people's need for being right, people's need for, um, you know, holding on to their worldview. Um, but really when it comes down to the, the idea of the secrets and the disclosure behind all of the, the agreements and the scapegoating, everything, I mean, you've written about this, right. And, and I mean, it's not new. So 
um, as somebody for me, for example, who sits on this, this side, unfortunately I have to say it's a side where even my family is like, no, you can't come for Thanksgiving unless you get your test and then you quarantine and then all this. And I'm, I'm like, I'm just, I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that. So I'm not going to agree or collude with this even. And so I, and I want to just honor you for saying like being willing to say, maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to be challenged. And then I'm willing to step back and say, well, maybe, maybe I ought to get this test. Maybe I, what's the big deal? I want to see my family. No, I'm not colluding with the story because I really believe that's the revolution. It's not once I collude with it, it's. Yeah. The the danger, like, I don't think it's wrong to, like you said, collude, like, I mean, I just was, you know, traveled abroad, so I had to get tested and so forth. <coughs> the way I looked at it, <clears throat> it's like, suppose you were going to visit um, a remote indigenous culture. And in that culture, everybody does certain rituals every day. As a gesture of respect, you're going to do those rituals too, even if you don't believe in them. Unless, I mean, but you might have a limit. You know, if one of the rituals is to, say, um, introduce some substance that you think is dangerous into your body, maybe you wouldn't do that ritual. So for me, it's not black and white. But there are some rituals where, yeah, I draw the line and I'm not going to inject that particular potion into my body. Um, There's something else I want to say about that. Uh, let's see, being disinvited to things. Um, I lost it. It was a good one too. Uh, can you just give me half a minute? You can cut it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so around like colluding with stuff. Right, colluding, yeah. Okay, yes, <clears throat> here it is. Um, yeah, you can keep that pause in there too, you know, this is real life and I don't always have every, anyway, the danger isn't so much in colluding per se, but it's when you start to believe the pretense that you're making. Then you become, as I say, an agent of your own gaslighting, where you say and do things that contradict your truth. At first, you know, it's a pretense, it's a show, but eventually the show becomes real. And you start to doubt like deep, direct experience and an instinct. Like, oh, I didn't see that. No, that's not real. I didn't feel that. Um, it's like, I use the metaphor of like, it's the bandits have gotten into the castle and you're running around as a fugitive, like not even daring say your truth to yourself too loudly, let alone other people, being hunted by these enforcers of the orthodoxy and, and not even being able to stand up to them because you've the, the seat of the soul has been usurped. And when I get into this state, and I've spent weeks and months at a time in it where I've been like, like disconnected from my truth, um, it's paralyzing. And what has brought me out of it has been, um, well, other people, like a community that holds sanity. And also like sometimes something just, or I remember a direct experience, I'm like, like all this stuff about science is real. Like, yeah, and who am I to, to you know, cast doubt upon science and all these dedicated biologists and virologists, they can't all be wrong, you know, and like, and then I'm like, hold on a second. I have had firsthand direct experiences in my life that defy scientific explanation. Did those not happen? And when they happened, I'm like, oh my God, I have been, I have been operating in a tiny corner of reality and possibility. And I'm sure you and many people listening to this have firsthand or at least secondhand come across phenomena that are flagrantly in violation of what science says is possible. So why, why do I discount those things? Why do I put those off into some container 
and operate in the narrow reality that can only be preserved by discounting those experiences. Or another thing that happens is I'll see something that just feels so wrong to me that I'm like, it bypasses all of this self-talk, all this self-doubt, self you know, like I saw a, a, a picture of um, like kids in a daycare and they're each of them inside this uh, six foot circle wearing masks separated from each other at a quote safe distance. And like, I'm like, no, this cannot be what normal childhood is. No. And I could make an argument that masks don't prevent transmission of aerosolized particles anyway, and a yada, 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 right? Like I could do a cost benefit kind of argument and the psychological effects of, of not seeing faces and not having touch and not having play and whatever. But there's something like, biological in me, animal in me that says no. Or the the, the, the video of like this two-year-old keeps trying to take off her mask, you know, and they keep putting it back on, you know, or the COVID safe childbirth. I saw a video right after childbirth where the, the mother is looking through a sheet of plastic at her newborn baby, holding it with gloves before it gets taken away to the to the nursery because maybe she's tested positive or like my friend who's an OBGYN, who's like, you know, having patients who, who test positive and their baby's taken away from them for the first two weeks of its life. And like, I'm like, you know, based on statistics, based on there's a whatever chance of a whatever chance, I'm like, and like, there's part of me that's like, no. And I fully recognize that somebody else could look at that same picture, that same video, hear that same story and have a totally different reaction. And that's okay. I don't need you to agree with my opinions, but this became an anchor to sanity for me. It's like, what is my body telling me here? Because like, I, my mind cannot make sense of, of things. There are so many contradictory, like the only way you can make sense of things today is if you limit yourself to only the, you know, uh, mainstream or only the alternative or only like if you limit yourself to a narrow spectrum of the full bandwidth of information, then you can make sense of things. But if you take it all in, it's bewildering. Like when it comes to vaccines and virology and stuff, I mean, there are PhDs who disagree vehemently with each other. How am I supposed to know? So yeah, that's, that's how I returned to sanity after, you know, going through this process of being an agent of my own gaslighting of the bandits breaching the walls of the castle and becoming a fugitive with my own truth. Wow. Ah, <laughs> uh, wow. Thank you. Um, I feel like we have been living a, uh, you know, like you're my alter ego. <laughs> yes. I've had from really walking a path and, and, and how you articulated, uh, my experience was just profound. So thank you. And I, I think that um, I'll often call it my own cognitive dissonance, but I like, I like your, your description better, an agent of your own gaslighting. Um, you know, one of the things that you said was that really stands out to me, and, and it's a practice that I'm sit, sitting in right now, because I'm having been going, bouncing back and forth between these places of, um, of, well, maybe, maybe, you know, I do understand, you know, how someone else can perceive what's going on right now. And, and that's absolutely not my truth and knowing, but to be in this place of like equanimity where I, where you finally do, you just know, and, and, and it's a kind of not being in judgment, but also knowing what your limit is and being able to just look at everything and, and hold it all. And, you know, what's my role here? What's my role yeah. here? And for me, that's, that's the dance I'm playing right now, because it's like, you know, am I just going to go and ha and just, you know, speak up and write on social media and like, for what, like, what is my role here? Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's the place where I'm sitting right now. So, um, you know, I, I want to, if, if you like, if you had a magic wand in your hand right now, Charles, what, and you can send a transmission, 
you know, whoever's listening, whoever will be listening or might listen because of this transmission, you could send this energetic frequency to the world, whether it's through your intention or your words, it really will resonate. Um, what would it be, you know, you, you, you know, connecting to whatever it is that needs to be transmitted, what would you want to, what magic or what energy would you want to transmit? You know, what's coming to me, I haven't even thought about, like this just speaking direct. Um, it's about goodwill and humor. Um, I uh, had to get my blood drawn today for this healing protocol. I'm going on this hardcore thing. Um, so, you know, I went to Quest Diagnostics, you know, and like everybody's all masked up, of course. And and these these are very conventional people. And I was joking around with the lady, you know, like, um, can't remember what jokes I was making, but we were laughing and stuff. It didn't matter that we probably had diametrically opposed views on many thought topics. It didn't matter because I was like, I just felt love, you know, and and humor, like laughing together establishes a solidarity. It establishes a unity um, because on some deep level, you are agreeing that um, this isn't all such a big deal. Like that our, that our differences are not as important as that we can laugh together. Like by agreeing, like, and, and when, when a uh, discourse degenerates beyond repair, it's when there's no humor anymore. Like, that's not funny. Like, humor is lost. And um, yeah, it's like, like even on a uh, esoteric level, like the idea that this whole thing, this whole human drama is a theater. Is, is a trauma. And after we die, we maybe get together and be like, wow, look at that. You did this, you did that. Wasn't that, wasn't that adorable? You know, like um, this, this sense of that this life with all its dramas isn't the deepest reality. Humor touches that mystical realization. It's the last resort in a way. Like if nothing else, works to connect with somebody to establish our common humanity even our common divinity it's humor that's the most powerful tool of coming back together it's a it's a peace offering you know so i guess you know my magic wand i would like to broadcast the truth that humor touches which isn't to say that our differences are unimportant and that the dramas of our current time are unimportant and we should just detach from them. But when we recognize that it is a drama and not the deepest reality, then it becomes a matter of playing the drama well, even as, you know, playing your part well. When, and, and and being curious too, um, how is this drama evolving? What is my next part to play? Because the the role uh, evolves over time. So you know, for me, at some point, and this is similar to what you were just saying, um, what is mine to say? What is mine to do? Who am I to be in these times? Eventually, I came to like, you know, I'm never going to be able to fully prove to other people's satisfaction or even to my own doubting mind's satisfaction that my stance on COVID issues is correct. But I came to a self-acceptance. I'm like, okay, this is who I am. I am defiant. I am skeptical of authority. I react in this way 
to children wearing masks all day. Um, and like, I accept this about myself and this is my role to play. And I can play it without hating others for playing their roles. And it's not like I leave you alone either, you know, and just don't take, no, but, but I engage with good humor so that I'm always an invitation into solidarity, always holding space for um, reunion, for reconciliation, for the, for courage, you know, to see other people as, yeah, when the moment comes, you will need to be brave too. And I'll be here for you to make that easier, to hold that space. And I hope that those, that there are those who will do that for me as well. When, because it's, it's like humiliating to be exposed for being wrong. You know, that self-image collapses, but it's a lot easier when you know that you are loved anyway. Then you don't have to hold on as much. You know, I'd love to be in a society where it's okay to feel shame because I know that I'm loved. I know that I'm safe. So I want to extend that to others and maybe encourage everybody to hold that loving place, which is the opposite of revenge and vindication, which is actually a coded form of domination. I'm going to be proven right and you'll be humiliated in the dust. No. It's like, hey, brother, hey, sister, we all mess up. Maybe you messed up this time. Maybe I messed up. But I love you anyway. We are human together. That is, that's the field that if we propagate that, there's a good chance, a good chance for this world. I think that might be the point where we let that sprinkle and sparkle <laughs> into the universe and say, thank you so much for your gift, Charles. I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful. Someone asked me, um, what do you, you know, what is the outcome you want to have with your podcast? I'm like, outcome. I, I just want to talk to people who I want to learn from and, and then share that with everybody. So thank you for that gift. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Catalyst Talks. Stay tuned for what's up next and please subscribe to our podcast and rate us wherever you listen. You'll find these all at catalysttalks.com. Join the conversation on social media. And if you'd like to reach out, please send me, Stephanie, a private message through stephanietraker.com. Your attention means the world to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you.